everyone and welcome to the lecture on salivary gland pathology. This is the third part lecture in the series of lectures on salivary gland tumors and lesions. So the learning outcome for this topic is uh, explain in detail the clinical features and histopathology of benign and malignant salivary gland tumors and uh, the cognitive level is C2. So in this topic, I would be discussing the salivary gland tumors, basically uh, the benign and malignant tumors. Uh, we will look through the classification, the WHO classification, and uh, I will outline in detail uh, selected important lesions based on uh, their frequency and their presentation in the head and neck region. Okay, I will also outline uh, one important lesion which has already been covered in the previous lecture. Uh, by Dr. Okay, Larry, so salivary gland tumors uh, but they I will, arise uh, in which any area in have cell 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 I will just be so outlining uh, the, in the entire um, maxillofacial region in the of that uh, and surrounding right. structures wherever there are salivary glands there is always a possibility of a tumor arising okay now it's more common in the hard palate uh, as compared to the soft palate Mm, the annual incidence varies from 1 to 6.5 cases per 100,000 people and salivary gland tumors have been found to be more common in females as compared to Now, males. according to the WHO histological classification for salivary gland tumors which has been revised in 2017 uh, following is the list of benign tumors Now, this is a very long list but uh, let's look through it uh, number one and the most common one is pleomorphic adenoma which is a benign tumor Myothelial, my, myothelioma, vessel cell adenoma, Worthen's tumors, uh, oncocytoma, lymph adenoma, cyst adenoma, ductal papilloma, and sebaceous adenoma. Okay. Now, out of these uh, benign tumors, the ones that we would be stressing on and would be outlining in this lecture would be pleomorphic adenoma and Worthen's tumor. When it comes to the malignant epithelial tumors of uh, the salivary gland, we have ethnic cell carcinoma, mucopidoma carcinoma. Adenoid cystic carcinoma, polymorphous low grade adenocarcinoma, epithelial myothelial carcinoma, clear cell carcinoma not, uh, not otherwise specified, basal cell adenocarcinoma, sebaceous carcinoma, sebaceous lymphoid, lymph adenocarcinoma, cyst adenocarcinoma, and many others as outlined. So, this is also the extended list of uh, malignant tumors of salivary gland. So out of all of these lesions, we will be uh, focusing mainly on uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, acinic cell carcinoma, and adenoid cystic carcinoma. Okay, so let's now look at pleomorphic adenoma. So pleomorphic adenoma is the most common salivary gland tumor. Okay, benign salivary gland tumor is the most common one in any ages, that is in children as well as in adults. It arises from the ductal reserve cells and the myoepithelial cells of uh, the salivary glands. Uh, these cells differentiate into epithelial or mesenchymal components. Now, as the name actually suggests, pleomorphic, that means pleo means many and morphic means morphological appearance. So that is characteristic of this adenoma. Adenoma is basically any gland, uh, glandular tumor is called adenoma. So in this salivary gland tumor, uh, the most common salivary gland tumor, what's actually happening is this ductal reserve and myothelial cells, they differentiate into different epithelial and mesenchymal components. And that's why in this tumor, histologically, we're able to see different epithelial components and mesenchymal components, which I will out outline further. Now, it has been identified uh, that this tumor occurs in patients who under who have uh, a cytogenic abnormality which has been mapped to 8q12 and 12q14 and 15. Now these two uh, genetic uh, mutations actually have been commonly seen in pleomorphic adenoma patients and pleomorphic adenoma has also been found to be associated with radiation exposure. So what are the clinical features for pleomorphic adenoma? Basically it commonly affects parotid which is 90% uh, and the rarest area that pleomorphic adenomas can occur is the sublingual area. A female to male ratio is 6 is to 4 
and the age group that it commonly affects is 30 to 60. Now I would like to highlight that in the previous WHO classification which was given in 2005, this age group was mentioned as 40 to 60 but now in the newer classification, in the newer uh, head and neck pathology uh, tumors outlined by the WHO, the age range has been extended to 30 from 30 to 60. So pleomophagidinomas, they start as small painless nodules, okay, nodule which uh, slowly begin, begin and increase in size. Uh, they characteristically have intermittent growth, that means they have phases where there is increase, this, the tumor increase in size and there's a, there could be a long period where there is no increase in size of the lesion absolutely. There's an irregular nodular, uh, it presents as an irregular nodular lesion firm to cystic in consistency, no fixation to underlying structure, something which is very typical of benign lesions. Skin ulcerations are very rarely seen. Now what exactly happens in pleomorphic adenoma is that it is a very slow growing tumor which has intermittent growth and because of that you will see that sometimes patients can come with massive large swellings. So here on this slide you are able to see a left parotid mass all right so this is a swelling here and a typical presentation where there is uh, where it affects the uh, inwards the uh, the lower ear lobe this is a picture of a patient who came with a very huge parotid swelling okay and uh, look at the massive size of this tumor the reason why it can actually expand to this size uh, without actually leading to ulceration is because of the intermittent and slow growth of the lesion. So let's now look at the histopathological features. So as I've mentioned at the outset that uh, in um, in pleomorphic adenomas basically uh, the epithelial and myoepithelial cells they differentiate uh, into various epithelial and mesenchymal components. Right, so that's why we see diverse structural com patterns composed of glandular epithelium and mesenchymal-like tissues. So under the epithelial component, what we actually see is forms of ducts, small cysts that contain eosinophilic coagulum, cells occur in sheets, nests or pods, and these cells appear spindle or plasma cytoid. Plasma cytoid means plasma-like, okay, plasma cell-like. Now the myoepithelial cells, on the other hand, they give rise to mesenchymal components that give the appearance of myxoid, chondroid or osteoid area. So the word pleomorphic meaning many morphological appearances in this benign, or benign salivary gland tumor is clearly indicated by the histological presentation. So this tumor. is the gross appearance of, of uh, a pleomorphic excised pleomorphic adenoma, right? So this, this whitish area more or less would be the mesenchymal component while the rest of the area could be a mix of the epithelial and the mesenchymal component and this surrounding part here is the capsule so it's a very well encapsulated benign tumor uh, which is which is not fixed to underlying structures this is the corresponding uh, slide all right uh, which which i can which is histopathological slide so as you look carefully here there is uh, uh, there is a fibrous capsule here uh, in the tumor out here down at the five o'clock position is normal parotid gland all right the fibrous capsule parotid gland and then the tumor mass over here so if you look carefully there's a larger pale basophilic area around here uh, clumps of uh, cells I'm sure these are the epithelioid component where the other areas the pale areas which which would be the mesenchymal component so this is the epithelial component here, the ductal formations that you are seeing, eosinophilic coagulum that we are able to see, and this area which is looking like the myxoid right? Up here again ductal structures that are formed, the epithelial component, and these are the plasma cytoid cells here in this frame of uh, the picture. There's another area where we can see chondroid area. This is how uh, the in the salivary gland tumor where you're able to see the area that resembles a cartilage. On the other hand, another area where you're able to see osteoid, that means bone-like. So basically, these are myoepithelial cells that have actually uh, that are presenting themselves 
uh, in, as osteoid presentation, chondroid presentation, and mixoid presentation. So overall, this is the histology of uh, pleomorphic adenomas and pleomorphic adenomas are benign tumors and uh, the treatment for these tumors is surgical excision with facial nerve preservation. The reason why the facial nerve is preserved is because these nerves, do, uh, these, this tumor does not uh, invade the nerve and cause nerve injury and thus uh, the the, when the surgical treatment is done, uh, this treatment is um, commonly that is given is piecemeal so the removal of the tumor is piecemeal done so that they can preserve the facial nerve. Now recurrence rates are lower that is around 3.4% uh, uh, after 5 years. So the overall prognosis for uh, pleomorphic adenoma is good. Now I'd like to explain these two com uh, these two very important terms uh, and lesions associated with pleomorphic adenoma. Whenever we discuss pleomorphic adenoma, there are two other terms that we should know them well. Number one is carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. Now carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma is a malignancy that develops from uh, which which develops from primary or recurrent. Uh, pleomorphic adenoma. So that means if there are multiple recurrences of pleomorphic adenoma, there's a very high chance of a subsequent recurrence turning out to show malignant features in the epithelial component or the mesenchymal component of the pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, when, when it leads to uh, epithelial uh, malignancy, then we call it a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. That means formerly it was a benign pleomorphic adenoma, but now it is showing malignant changes in the epithelial component. The second term is metastasizing pleomorphic adenoma. Now the, the biggest difference here in metastasizing pleomorphic adenoma is pleomorphic. It is basically a pleomorphic adenoma which has benign histopathological features just like how we just saw, but it presents with secondary tumors in distant sites. Okay, commonly uh, metastasizing to the bone. Right. Uh, this is this is the difference between carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma and metastasizing pleomorphic adenoma. Now let's look at the second benign tumor, which is Warthin's tumor. Now Warthin's tumor is also called papillary cyst adenoma lymphomatosum or adenolymphoma. Uh, majority of these uh, of cases they occur in the paroptid gland and this is one uh, very unique salivary gland tumor which is uh, where smoking has been identified as an important uh, contributing factor that means many most more, many patients majority of the patients have smoking as one of the uh, factors the histogenesis for this tumor has been uh, has been identified as arising from salivary gland tissue that is entrapped in paraparotid or intraparotid lymph nodes. So during the embryological process of development of uh, parotid glands, sometimes uh, there is a chance of parotid salivary gland tissue getting entrapped into the lymph nodes of uh, the paraparotid and intraparotid lymph nodes. Those salivary entrapped salivary gland tissues uh, undergo uh, a benign uh, tumor proliferation giving rise to the Warthin's tumor. Clinical features, now again it has a female predilection of 9 is to 1 commonly occurring in age above 60 years in females. Uh, patient presents with painless firm swelling in the parotid not exceeding more than 5 centimeters. Now the histopathological features uh, there is an epithelial component and a lymphoid component. Now I would like to bring your attention back to the the, the alternative names for Warthin tumor where I said that the other name that we use is called papillary cyst adenoma lymphomatosum. If you remember this term and if you can actually uh, uh, understand what this terminology means, it is very, it will make it easier for you to remember the histopathology. So papillary cyst adenoma lymphomatosum. So what we actually see in this particular tumor in this adenoma is cyst formation with papillary projections. So papillary cyst adenoma is uh, a tumor of a salivary gland 
and we are saying lymphomatosum that is in the cystic spaces you are saying lymphocytic matrix showing germinal centers similar to normal lymph nodes all right so this is characteristic histopathological feature of Porthen's tumor papillary cyst adenoma lymphomatosum is the histopathological picture of, uh, uh, of a lesion that has been excised uh, this is normal parotid tissue there is a bureau there is a very well defined fibrous capsule and this is the tumor tissue now if you look at the tumor tissue you can see pale eosinophilic areas and dark basophilic areas Now these cysts are lined by bilayer tall columnar cells with fine granular eosinophilic cytoplasm, dense lymphocytic matrix with germinal centers and eosinophilic coagulum is seen. So if we zoom in further, you'll be able to see the cystic spaces. These are all the cystic spaces, right? There's empty space here, empty space here, empty space here. Now when we zoom in further, this cystic space inside the cystic space this is the eosinophilic coagulum that we are able to see and this is lined by the double layer or uh, the double layer papillary cystic structures uh, that are lined by the oncocytic epithelial and the lymphoid stroma in between uh, these cells okay so this epithelial component is formed by the inner columnar and outer cuboidal cells so the inner columnar right so the inner columnar and outer cuboidal cells and this is the lymphocytic component so papillary cyst adenoma uh, lymphomatosum so this is the histopathological presentation of Worthen's tumor this is another picture here you can see the papillary projection the papillary projections are there the cystic formation in inside that you can see the eosinophilic coagulum and in these uh, uh, these uh, these papillary projections they are lined by the uh, inner columnar and outer cuboidal cells and inside that inside the projection you are actually able to see the lymphocytic component with germinal center uh, which is classical of Worthen's tumor again another image to actually uh, appreciate the the lining of the uh, that that is seen in this Orton's tumor. Okay, moving on. Let's now look at uh, malignant salivary gland tumors. Um, now, the most common one in major and minor salivary glands is the mucoepidermoid carcinoma. All right, uh, 29 to 34 percent of all uh, salivary gland tumors in the major and minor salivary glands are mostly mucoepidermoid carcinomas. All right, the most common site is parotid and the palatal regions okay so if there's a patient who comes up with the swelling in the palatal region or in the parotid region uh, where we are suspecting a malignancy mucopidermoid definitely is uh, number one on the list so clinical features uh, has female predilection age group is 30 to 50 years uh, patient usually complains of slow to rapidly growing swelling uh, trismus uh, that is difficulty in mouth opening pain facial nerve paralysis all right uh, whenever a patient with a salivary gland uh, swelling uh, complains of facial nerve paralysis uh, we have to think in term we have to suspect malignancy and uh, do the needful to rule it out tumor infiltrates the surrounding structures and may even metastasize because it is a malignancy now, histopathologically what we see basically mucoepidermoid so we are seeing the tumor is composed of mucus secreting cells, epidermoid cells, and intermediate cells. Now, these uh, these are the three types of cells that are seen in the mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Now, mucoepidermoid carcinoma is uh, graded a, uh, is graded as low grade, intermediate grade, and high grade. Right, where low grade has the best prognosis and high grade has the poorer progno poorest prognosis. Now, in low grade, what we see is we see well formed glandular structures, numerous cystic spaces, which is filled with mucin, minimal atypia, and a large number of mucus cells. So, you have to remember that when, when if, if the tumor is low grade, then we are going, it has good prognosis. And when there's good prognosis, we should be able to see a large number of mucus cells. 
okay so the prognosis histolo histopathological prognosis in mucoabdominal carcinoma is inversely proportional to the number of mucus cells that are visible in histopathologically okay so greater the number of mucus cells seen in the tumor the better the prognosis so this is the histo composite histopathological view this is the cystic space this white cystic space that you are seeing okay i'm going to show so this cystic space on on zooming further is made up of uh, epidermoid cells these are epidermoid cells okay and uh, that means looking like epithelial cells and this uh, pale uh, eosinophilic cells that are that you're seeing are basically so a little more zoomed in picture this is the epidermoid cells and these are the mucus cells okay these are the mucus cells so larger amount of mucus cells cystic spaces and epidermoid cells we grade it as low grade mucoabdominal carcinoma now intermediate grade mucoabdominal carcinoma primarily will show solid areas which is composed of epidermoid cells intermediate cells seen in large areas and cystic spaces with mucus cells less than low grade now how do we differentiate between uh, epidermoid cells and intermediate cells so intermediate cells primarily appear more basaloid that means the nucleus is darker the cytoplasm is less whereas epidermal cells have larger eosinophilic cytoplasm and the nucleus size is smaller than that of intermediate cells so if you look if we look here carefully there are cystic spaces in this slide all right less number of mucus mucus glands that we can see mucus cells that we can see and the cells that we are seeing uh, have larger darker nucleus and lesser amount of cytoplasm whereas in the high grade you seeing you are going to see solidness and cords of epidermoid cells lot of atypical features less number of mucus cells and cystic spaces necrosis as well as perineural invasion may be seen now perineural invasion may be seen in uh, as the grade of the tumor worsens there is a higher chance of perineural now this is a hypercellular image okay of a high grade a uh, mucoabdominal carcinoma if you look at it these white spaces uh, some of them that are there are are probably the mucus cells all the others are epidermoid cells where we can confidently and of of course there are scattered intermediate cells as well but the amount of in, uh, epidermoid cells is more than that of intermediate cells okay so this is high grade mucoabdominal carcinoma the treatment for uh, mucoabdominal carcinomas is surgical excision with radical neck dissection uh, similar to oral squamous cell carcinoma uh, the radical neck dissection is done because uh, these tumors metastasize uh, uh, and can cause uh, destruction so post operative radiation therapy is also considered in high grade lesions now prognosis as i told you the best prognosis is that of low grade mucoabdominal carcinoma and the poor, poorest prognosis is that of high grade uh, mec fair prognosis is that for intermediate grade uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma okay so uh, when we look at prognosis low and intermediate grade uh, mucoderma mucoepidermoid carcinomas are less aggressive and generally cured by uh, complete surgical excision the 10 year overall survival rates for low intermediate and high grade mecs are approximately 90% 70% and 25% respectively so that is the the 5 year survival uh, the 10 year survival rates in patients uh, based on the histological grade so high grade uh, mucoderma carcinoma patients uh, only 25% of them survive uh, disease free Uh, after 10 years okay now let's look at adenoid cystic carcinoma now adenoid cystic carcinoma is a slow growing and uh, is a slow growing but aggressive lesion with high recurrence uh, it, it is described as a relentless salivary gland malignancy and uh, it is composed of epithelial myoepithelial neoplastic cells that form various patterns including Cribriform pattern, tubular pattern, solid cystic pattern is the second most common uh, salivary gland malignancy, and the annual incidence of adenoid cystic carcinoma is in the range of two cases per hundred thousand uh, on an average. 
Coming to clinical features, uh, patients usually present with swelling or masses and they may have numbness, paresthesia or pain. Uh, the common sites that are actually involved are parotid, submandibular, palatal, minor syllabic glands in the tongue. The common age that it affects is 5 to 6 decades. Again, females are commonly affected. Swelling, patients might present with swelling with ulceration, as I mentioned, uh, local pain. Uh, nerve involvement and fixation to deeper structures. So this tumor actually has an affinity to nerve fibers and uh, it invades the nerves and uh, spreads through perineural spaces, which is why the prognosis for adenoid cystic carcinoma is, is very Histologically, histopathologically, these tumors, uh, this tumor is composed of myopthelial cells and ductal dissolved cells. They grow in cribriform pattern, which is uh, the most classical pattern, uh, uh, followed by solid, tubular, and cystic. Uh, this cribriform pattern basically is composed of basaloid epithelial cell nests, which resemble Swiss cheese or honeycomb pattern. I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, the lumina of these cells contain pass positive mucopolysaccharide. The cribriform pattern is the most common pattern. This is what is called cribriform. Okay, uh, these are the myopthelial uh, basaloid looking cells. This material is basically pass positive mucinous material that mucopolysaccharide material that is present. Now, this is the tumor composition. So, this tumor is uh, highly composed of basaloid looking cells. Okay. Now, this appearance is resembles very similar to the Swiss cheese, right? And the holes that are present in the Swiss cheese. Uh, resembles, um, I mean, histologically resembles the adenoid cystic carcinoma. That's why the uh, description. So again, this is a high power view. Look at the uh, the very minimal uh, cytoplasm present in these cells. A lot of uh, new, uh, ba mainly basophilic nucleus that is present, and uh, the the cribri form area that we are seeing uh, is composed of uh, mucopolysaccharide material so this is the histopathological slide where you can clearly see uh, a nerve bundle here and the perineural invasion so the tumor cells have invaded the perineural space and once they actually invade the perineural space basically uh, they uh, they travel through the they are able to travel through the perineural sheath and spread and give rise to newer tumors uh, in distant locations okay that is the reason why this tumor has a very poor prognosis so the treatment and prognosis for adenoid cystic carcinoma uh, radical surgical excision with or without post-operative radiation is the treatment of choice uh, when we look at prognosis the 10 year survival rate has been reported to be 50 to 70 percent all right in various uh, different literature local recurrences are high because of perineural invasion uh, as we've already discussed, uh, but greater than 50% of cases that are reported show report uh, report back with distant metastasis, thus uh, thus thus uh, decreasing survival as well as uh, reducing the, the uh, I mean making the prognosis poorer. Let's now look at the third malignant uh, salivary gland tumor, which is eosinophilic cell carcinoma. Now, eosinophilic cell carcinoma mainly can occurs in the parotid. Uh, occurs in the parotid. Other sites that are affected are the lip and the buccal mucosa. Okay. Uh, women in the age group of 40 years and above are at are generally the ones who who, who who have been identified to get this uh, tumor. The lesion is slow growing, mobile, or fixed mass with associated pain and tenderness. Logically, tumor is composed mainly of serous SNR cells with uh, granular basophilic cytoplasm and a round darkly stained eccentric nucleus okay so these cells are arranged in various growth patterns other cells that are seen are intercalated duct cells clear cells and lymphoid elements this is the histopathological image of uh, SNR, ethnic cell carcinoma all right so what we can see here is basically uh, SNR and ductal cells with variable vacuolated uh, basophilic appearing granular cytoplasm okay, okay. snr cells are 
large and polygonal with basophilic granular cytoplasm and round and eccentrically placed nuclei which you can clearly appreciate uh, the nucleus is eccentrically placed in these SNR cells the granules, the granules uh, give a diastase uh, resistance PAS uh, reaction which may be focal okay so this is one of the special frame that can be done SNX cell carcinomas rarely show mitosis necrosis or any significant pleomorphism now the treatment for SNX cell carcinoma they are generally not aggressive uh, only a proportion of them show metastasis recurrence rates are high as high as 35 percent and uh, the 20 year survival rate as reported by WHO is approximately 90 percent so it has a good prognosis as compared to other tumors okay lastly let's look at necrotizing cellular metaplasia and as I mentioned at the outset uh, I think this has already been covered in the previous lecture uh, by Dr. Lari, but I would like to uh, again go through it because there is a histopathological uh, important aspect about uh, necrotizing metaplasia. So, first of all, it's a non neoplastic inflammatory condition. Okay, clinically and histopathological features simulate malignancies like squamous cell carcinomas and mucopidomal carcinomas. This is the most important thing that you need to remember and and get it get it uh, understood. So the etiology here is vascular ischemia and it has been identified to tobacco and cigarette smoking all right so patients with tobacco with cigarette smoking habits uh, do present with these lesions and many a times these lesions can clinically as well as microscopically mimic squamous cell carcinoma or microbiome carcinoma thus uh, making it challenging for diagnosis okay uh, by nature this is a non neoplastic inflammatory condition Clinical features present on the palate, female to male ratio 2 is to 1, painless swelling with or without ulceration 1 to 3 centimeters in size. There's, all, there's a cratery form ulceration of the palate that is commonly seen, which is generally unilateral. This is commonly how it looks, alright. So there's a crater, it appears a central necrotic area, uh, patient has a tobacco use history, and immediately you are thinking in terms of squamous cell carcinoma or probably uh, mucopotamia carcinoma. But it's only when you actually do the histopathology that you will be you uh, an experienced uh, experienced pathologist will be able to differentiate it and will be able to come up with a diagnosis of necrotizing cellular metaplasia. So histologically, what do we see? We see coagulative necrosis of glandular SNI and squamous metaplasia of duct, which is what resembles the uh, the squamous cell carcinoma component. Pseudo epithelial matter hyperplasia, but with no dysplastic features. So that is where the differentiation occurs, right? So this is the appearance, this is the surface epithelium, this is pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia and not invasion. This is not invasion, this is pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. When you look carefully, there is no dysplasia on this slide. So this is not squamous cell carcinoma, not mucopodomite carcinoma, but is necrotizing sialometaplasia, which is a uh, which is uh, which is which is a uh, a benign uh, tumor-like condition of the cellular metaplasia of the ducts that is seen in necrotizing cellular metaplasia. So basically, this this can very easily confuse uh, 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 even a pathologist uh, because it mimics like an island of squamous cell carcinoma where there is invasion and where uh, this is an island. Uh, you know, which is uh, appearing to have uh, metaplasia here. And here for necrotizing cellular metaplasia is number one, it resolves spontaneously as soon as usually when surgical excision is done, it heals and does not recur. Okay, so incisional biopsy is required for diagnosis, and uh, once the surgical excision is done, uh, the prognosis is excellent. So with this, we come to the end of the topic on salivary glands with respect to. Uh, the components on tumor. Thank you very much.